why did God save you? Why did God save you? Have, have you ever given much thought to that question? You know, it's not really a bad question, is it? Uh, I mean, you were, after all, dead in your sins and trespasses, right? You shared in the guilt and corruption of Adam's first sin. You were an enemy of God, a sinner brought forth in iniquity. You were a sinner who sinned and deserved to die. That's the bad news that we as God's people know this morning, right? That each and every one of us deserve God's just judgment. But then we know the good news on the other side of that equation, don't we? The good news that just at the right time, Jesus died for you. The good shepherd laid his life down for you. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath for you. His death on the cross means that God is now for you instead of against you. We know all of these wonderful truths that by faith through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you are now reconciled, justified, adopted as a child of God. And we know and we sing this glorious, wonderful news as God's people, don't we? But why? Why did God do this for you? Maybe you've thought about other good questions related to your salvation, like the question of how does God save you, or the question of what must I do to be saved, or the question of when was I saved. But have you ever considered this question, why did God save you? Now, answers may be swirling through your mind right now, and there's certainly more than one right answer to that question. We have an answer like we see in John 3.16, that God saved us simply because he loves us, right? We know from a passage like Ephesians chapter 1, at the, the beginning 12 verses there, we know that God saved us for the praise of his glorious grace. Those are certainly two of the best answers to that question of why did God save you. But let me offer you this morning one more reason. Just as good, just as biblical, and just as important as those God saved you that you might be holy, that you might be holy. You know, for the last few weeks, we've been camping out in these four verses in the book of Titus, one of Paul's pastoral epistles. And we've looked at this passage for the last couple weeks. And in the first week, we looked backwards, didn't we? We looked backwards to the incarnation and the appearing of the grace of God as the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh for our sake. And we just celebrated this truth in Christmas in this last week, right? And then last Sunday, we looked forward to the second coming of Jesus and the appearing not that time of the grace of God, but of the glory of God. And we saw that Jesus will return one day, won't he, to fully and finally save his people and to fully and justly judge the world. And now this week, we're going to turn our attention to this same passage one last time. And we're going to see ourselves not looking backwards and not looking forward, but this morning looking to this present age, this present age where we stand between these two appearances. And as we live our lives between the first appearing in the incarnation and the second appearing in the second coming, we are asking our question, what, asking this question, what is our life to look like? What should our life look like now in this present age as we stand between these two appearances? So I'm going to ask you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And just as we stand for the reading or for the Pledge of Allegiance and many other things that we do for the American flag, I'm going to ask you with much more reverence and much more honor to stand now with me for the reading of God's perfect, inerrant, sufficient word. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Amen. You can be seated. So as we look to this passage again this morning, as we end our three-week series here in this passage, we are primarily going to be looking here this morning at verse 12 and also verse 14. And we're going to examine this topic uh, 
of holiness or the process of sanctification in the believer's life. And just as a, as a s- summation sentence, this is the main point that I would give you this morning that we're going to look at. As we stand between two appearances, those being the incarnation and the second coming, as we stand between two appearances, holiness is to be a distinguishing mark of our lives. So let's just jump right in here this morning and look at the first of our three points on holiness. Number one, holiness is one of the goals of your redemption. It is one of the goals of your redemption. As I said a minute ago, when we answered this question of why has God saved you, we know that one of the reasons, not the only reason for sure, but one of the reasons that God has saved us, that God has redeemed us, that God has called us to himself is that we would be a holy people. We see it here even in our passage in Titus. Look with me at verse 14. As he ends verse 13 there, he says that we're waiting for the appearing of our glory in God, uh, the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now describing this Jesus, look how he picks up in verse 14. He says that this Jesus who gave himself for us. And then he goes on to give some reasons, doesn't he? Why does it say in verse 14 that he gave himself for us? He says, number one, to redeem us from all lawlessness, but also note number two, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good work. So you see what Paul is saying here. He's saying that Jesus gave his life as a substitutionary sacrifice for his people first to redeem us, right? To redeem us from all lawlessness. We know this truth, don't we? That outside of Christ, each and every one of us this morning in all the world are slaves to sin, aren't we? We are held captive as a prisoner to sin and to Satan with zero hope of escape and zero hope of ransom on our own. But we know this good news of the gospel that Jesus came and he lived his perfect life. He died his sacrificial and substitutionary death to redeem his people, to liberate us from that captivity, to break the power of sin and Satan in our lives. He did this for all of us this morning who would believe in him by faith alone through grace alone. And if you're here this morning and you are a redeemed son of God, if you are a redeemed child of God, you know this truth that this is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone in your life. You know that Jesus has laid his life down to redeem you from all lawlessness. Let me pause here for just a moment. If you're here this morning and you have never placed your faith and hope in this Jesus, let me rest assured and tell you that Jesus invites you even this very morning to do just that, to turn from your sin and to turn to him as the sacrifice for your sin. And you too will be redeemed from your sin as we see in this verse. And we know this truth, and we sing this truth, and we glory in this truth, and it's a wonderful truth, isn't it? That he redeems us from sin. But that's not the only thing that Paul says in this verse of why Jesus laid his life down. Notice that second phrase there. Not only to redeem us from all lawlessness, but also, secondly, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This language that Paul is using here in verse 14 is holiness type language. Jesus has given his life not only to redeem you from sin, but also to purify for himself a people who are zealous for good works. Now, this is not just a truth in this passage, is it? This is a common refrain throughout the New Testament and indeed throughout the entire Bible that God has worked in and saved a people that they would be holy. Think about that glorious passage from Ephesians 1. Many of us know that glorious passage of how Paul speaks of our predestination before the foundation of the world to the praise of God's glorious grace and on and on. What a great passage that is. But right there at the beginning in verses 3 and 4, listen to what Paul says. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing blessing in the heavenly places, Listen, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and blameless before him. 
So he says God chose us in eternity past. He sent Christ in history, and he gave us the gift of faith by the working of the Holy Spirit for a reason, so that we would be holy. And Paul's not talking here about the righteousness of Christ that's reckoned to our account when we believe in Christ, what we call justification. He's talking here about our personal holiness as God's people, our lives that are marked in the present day and the present time by this act of following Christ and being conformed to his image. J.I. Packer puts it like this. In reality, he says, holiness is the goal of our redemption. As Christ died in order, in order that we may be justified, so we are justified in order that we may be sanctified and made holy. You see, this sort of distinctive holiness for God's people is not something that's new or distinctively new in the New Testament. It's been God's plan throughout both Testaments. Think about God's words to his people in Exodus 19 as he tells them there, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptian, how I, Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Then he says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and what? A holy nation. We see Peter in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 apply this same language and these same truths to the church of Christ there in 1 Peter 2 9. We see this throughout various New Testament passages. Listen to 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. Paul says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now listen, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Ephesians 5.25-27, through 27, this passage that speaks to husbands and their role to love wives. Right in the middle of there, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. He goes on and speaks of Christ presenting the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Bible could not be any clearer. One of the key reasons for your salvation, one of the designs behind your salvation, one of the purposes for which God chose you in the first place is your holiness. As we see in those passages that clear truth throughout God's word, though, that holiness is one of the goals of your redemption, we must say something else so that it is clear. It should, in one sense, go without saying, but unfortunately, it's not. This life of holiness, this process of sanctification, this pursuit of Christ-likeness in our life is not an additional add-on for the elite few. Rather, our second point here, not only is holiness one of the goals of your redemption, but holiness is the necessary fruit of your redemption. It is the necessary fruit of your redemption. Now, hear me out before you go out of here sounding the legalistic alarm, right? Just listen for a moment to what Scripture says on this point. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 7, 21, when he tells his disciples, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but listen to what he says, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is teaching his disciples here in Matthew chapter 7 that it is possible, isn't it, for us as God's people or for us as people to testify to and to profess the right things but not really be saved. The proof or evidence, Jesus says, is found in the person's actions. We have many passages like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, or Galatians 5, 19 through 20 that teach that, quote, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. We see this consistent and frequent teaching throughout the Bible that those whose lives are marked by habitual ungodliness will not go to heaven. We, we see the entire book of 1 John outlining several criteria for determining whether or not we truly belong to God, right? Pastor Kevin preached through that book for several months, almost a year, and we saw several, that wasn't a knock, that was just <laughs> objective fact, right? <laughs> but several criteria, several tests, several markers that he gave us over and over again 
where he showed us how John shows several criteria for determining whether or not we belong to God. We see, we see that not only will those born of God confess the Son and believe that Jesus is the Christ, which that is true, but also they will keep God's commandments, 1 John 2, 3 and 4. They will walk as Christ walked, 1 John 2, 5 and 6. They will practice righteousness, 1 John 2, 29. And they will overcome the world, 1 John 5, 4. We see in the book of James, don't we, that it is clear that faith without accompanying works is what? It's dead. It's not saving faith, is it? And then we have the verse in Hebrews 12, verse 14, where the author there says this, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the, uh, see the Lord. In other words, we see time and time again in God's word that holiness is simply not an option. It is a necessary fruit to your redemption. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, a debate that raged throughout the evangelical world several decades ago, really the early 90s. This debate raged through the evan evangelical world referred to as the lordship controversy. Essentially, this controversy was a, a debate about this role of holiness in the believer's life and whether or not it was a necessary component and accompaniment to one's redemption. The, the debate was sort of framed like this. Can you have Jesus as your Savior without having Jesus as your Lord? And so those who said yes to that question would make this distinction between Christians, they would call, and disciples, arguing that the former, the Christians, are simply those who believe in Jesus, they profess Jesus, they just haven't really fully given their lives to Jesus yet. And the latter, the disciples, are those who have really taken that next step of obedience and submitting their life to Jesus. It's through this whole debate that you hear talk of, quote, carnal Christians, as if there's three categories of people instead of two. Category one being unbelievers, category two being disciples sold out for Jesus, and then this middle category of carnal Christians who are really Christians, they say. They're really going to heaven. They just haven't really submitted their life to Jesus as Lord yet. And you may have never heard of this controversy. You may have never heard of this phrase, the lordship salvation controversy, but trust me, you have felt its effects. You have felt its effects all around you. This teaching and this subsequent easy believism that ensued where mass droves of people would, quote, come to Jesus and, quote, be converted with no evidence of fruit in their lives to follow is something that swept through American Christianity and especially in the South, and it is still alive and well today. You know, back then in the early 90s, John MacArthur was one of the primary defenders of biblical doctrine through this controversy. He wrote a book that many of you, I'm sure, have read called The Gospel According to Jesus. And in this book, he was directly combating those on the other side of this issue who were saying that you could have Jesus as Savior without Lord. And MacArthur says, no, that is simply not a biblical doctrine. Now, during that same season in the early 90s, John Piper wrote a, a positive review of MacArthur's book, and he received some very strong pushback to his review. And specifically, he received some pushback from a fellow pastor and friend in his area. And then Piper wrote a, a, a response to this friend called, quote, Letter to a Friend Concerning the So-Called Lordship salvation. You can still find that letter on Desiring God's website. It's well worth your read. But I say all of that to tell you this. At the end of that letter, Piper offers his friend an appendix, an appendix that, which lists texts that point to the necessity of yielding to Christ as Lord in order to inherit eternal life. Let me tell you, it's a long list. Listen to what Piper mentions there in that appendix. Six passages from the New Testament that speak to the necessity of doing good for eternal life. Thirteen passages on the necessity of obedience. Two on the necessity of holiness. Two on the, the need to forgive others. Four on the necessity of not living according to the flesh. Two on the necessity of being free from the love of money. Fourteen on the need to love Christ and God. And six on the necessity of loving 
others. And there are literally dozens and dozens more verses that speak to the same thing, that speak to the necessity of loving the truth, to bridling the tongue, to persevering, to walking in light, to repenting, to fighting the good fight. In other words, brothers and sisters, God's word is crystal clear that the child of God must be holy. The child of God must be holy. Not only is holiness one of the goals of your redemption, it is one of the necessary fruits of that redemption. Now let me make it crystal clear to you this morning that stressing the necessity of personal holiness should not in any way undermine our confidence in justification by faith alone through grace alone. Faith and works are both necessary, but one is the root and one is the fruit. You see, God's word is robustly clear that God declares us just and forgiven solely on account of the righteousness of Christ credited to us. Our innocence before God is in zero way grounded in our works of love or in our acts of charity. Getting right with God is entirely, completely, 100% dependent on faith. But listen, brothers and sisters, this faith that joins you to Christ and makes you right with him is a faith that works itself out in love and in obedience by the power of God working in you. On the last day, God will not acquit us because of our good works, as if we could be good enough to earn heaven, but he will look for evidence that our confession was not phony. And it's in that sense that we must be holy. Or as Luther so famously put it, we're saved by faith alone, but that faith that saves is what? It's never alone. So we must be sure to fully and unambiguously affirm and guard this truth that salvation is by faith alone. But brothers and sisters, just as we must be sure to affirm this about justification as scripture clearly teaches it, so we must not let our fear of legalism or our fear of a works-based salvation keep us from affirming the other clear teachings of Scripture, that holiness and a life of obedience to Jesus is not an optional add-on, but is the necessary fruit of a truly justified life. Listen how Kevin DeYoung puts it. He says, don't be so scared of works righteousness that you make pale what the Bible paints in bold colors. We are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8, and we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2 verse 10. He goes on to say, any gospel which purports to save people without also transforming them is inviting easy believism. If you If you think being a Christian is nothing more than saying a prayer or joining a church, then you've confused real grace with cheap grace. Those who are justified will be sanctified. It's plain on almost every page of the Bible. He ends by saying, we are commanded to be holy, saved to be holy, and in fact, we must be holy if we are to inherit eternal life. So we see it's clear from God's word this morning that holiness is one of the goals of our redemption. It is necessary. It is a necessary fruit of our redemption. But how exactly do you and I pursue this holiness? That leads us to our third point and to our passage here in Titus this morning. Our third point, holiness is not automatic. It requires discipline. Listen, people do not simply drift toward godliness, do they? If you've ever been to an ocean and you've gone out maybe 100 yards or so off the shore and you've laid out on the float, uh, what happens in about 15 or 20 minutes? You've drifted a significant point away from your original starting point where all your chairs and your beach stuff are, right? Or if you've ever gone tubing or rafting down a river, if you do no paddling, if you do no anything at all, what happens? You just drift along with the water, don't you? Well, let me assure you this morning, left to itself and left with no discipline and no intentional action on your part, the current that our lives will drift along with is not godliness. It is not holiness. Without effort and without discipline, we will drift not toward godliness, but toward worldliness. Listen to how D.A. Carson puts it. It's a longer quote, but it was so good for me this week. He says, People do not drift toward holiness. Uh, 
Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. He says, we drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and we call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we've escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. Look back with me at verse 12 in Titus chapter 2 and look at that very first word that he says in verse 12. He says that the grace of God that has appeared to us, verse 12, is training us. You see, the Christian's pursuit of holiness is one that includes and involves training and discipline. This Greek word that he uses here is the word paiduo, which carries this idea of training or teaching, educating or nurturing. It's the term that we get our English word from, pedagogy. You see, this grace of God has appeared in the person of Jesus, as we saw in verse 11, and we see now he is not only our deliverer, but he is our teacher and our guide and our counselor. You see, when we were saved, we immediately came under the instruction of God through his Holy Spirit and through his word. And we see God's grace in and through Jesus Christ is actively training us is training us. We see God's word replete with passages throughout the New Testament on the role of this godly discipline and training in the Christian's life. Think about a passage like Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Just listen as I read this passage and note with me the active verbs that you hear, the active verbs that we as believers are called to do. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, we are told to train ourselves for godliness. He goes on in verse 8, bodily training is of some value, he says, uh, but godliness is of value in every way. Philippians 4, 7, and 8, we know this passage where we're called to Think on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just and pure and lovely. And Paul says, think about these things. Verse 9, practice these things. We're told in 1 Timothy 6, 12 to fight the good fight. Philippians 3, 12 and 14 to press on and strain forward. 2 Peter 1, 5 to make every effort on and on and on we could go. We are to put to death the deeds of the body in Romans 8, not present our members to sin in Romans 6, discipline our body and keep it under control in 1 Corinthians 9. Over and over, the New Testament paints this consistent picture, brothers and sisters, that holiness is not automatic, but it involves active discipline in your life. Perhaps the most applicable to our current verse that we're going to look at is the put off and put on passages of Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. We have this passage in Ephesians 4 where Paul says that we have been taught in Jesus to put off our old self, which belongs to our former manner of life. And he says we are to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so in that same manner, in that same type of thinking of putting off and putting on, in verse 12 here in Titus 2, Paul does a very similar thing. He presents both a negative side and a positive side to this training in holiness. He says in the beginning of the verse that we are being trained to renounce some things. And then he says on the positive side at the end of verse 12 that we are being trained to live or put on other things. So let's look first at the negative side as we end our time in God's word this morning. First, he says, our training in Christ's likeness involves putting off certain things. Notice the two things that he lists here in verse 12, where he says that we are being trained by this grace of God that has appeared to us. We are being trained to renounce two things. Number one, he says we are being trained to renounce ungodliness. 
ungodliness translates this word asabia, which here refers to a lack of true reverence and devotion to God. It's against this same word, this same ungodliness and unrighteousness of men that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven in Romans 1, 18. This is a, this is a wide net word that refers to all manner of sin and unrighteousness. Indeed, anything that you can think of that falls outside of the limits of pleasing to God and as an act of obedience to his word could be categorized by this word ungodliness. Secondly, look at what he tells us to renounce here in verse 12. Not only do we renounce ungodliness, but we renounce worldly passions. This refers to sins that although we may not have actually committed them, we nevertheless long to and we desire to. These desires could, be, could include all of the countless sinful lusts and cravings that characterize the natural man. They include the youthful lusts and desires of 2 Timothy 2.22, the fleshly lusts and desires of 1 Peter 2.22, and all of the foolish and harmless desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction from 1 Timothy 6.9. So brothers and sisters, as you consider this call to holiness in your life, as you consider how you were saved and redeemed to be holy, as you, were, as you consider how holiness is not an optional add-on but is a necessary fruit of your redemption, as you consider how this holiness is not automatic but it requires discipline, as you consider your life today, what are those acts of ungodliness or those worldly desires that you need to renounce this morning? that you need to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness and forsake for the sake of following Christ? Have you drifted with the current of the culture and your own indwelling sin and allowed yourself to act on or even desire in your mind and heart those things that are displeasing to the Lord? Are there any areas in your life right now of hidden sin that you need to confess and repent of? Are there any areas of your private life right now that should they become public, you would be ashamed of? I urge you this morning from God's word to renounce those things. Repent of those things. Confess those things. Find a trusted person in your life to seek accountability with for these things. You know, I can't list all the things that could fall under this category of ungodliness or worldly desires. There are really too many to count and too multifaceted in their nature, but you know what they are, don't you? And if you're God's child this morning, you have been convicted over them. Ask yourself, are there any areas of untruthfulness, perhaps, that you have fallen prey to? Are there any areas of sexual sin that you have been hiding in the dark? Are there areas of laziness and worldliness that you have been excusing? Are there areas of spiritual disciplines that you have grown lax to and have excused away for too long? Brothers and sisters, God's word tells us here in Titus 2.11 that the grace of God has appeared to us in the person of Jesus Christ to train us to renounce these things, to renounce this ungodliness and worldly passions. Ask yourself this morning, how are you yielding to the work of the Spirit in your life and the work of the Word in your life and the work of God's people in your life and actively training yourself to renounce these things? Now, he not only has a negative side here where he tells us to renounce and put off certain things, but on the other side, he tells us that our training in Christ's likeness involves putting on certain things. Look back to Titus chapter 2 in the second half of that verse. Not only are we to renounce those things, but he says we are to live in a certain way. And he mentions three specific ways. Number one, we are being trained to live self-controlled lives. Self-controlled carries this basic idea of having a sound mind. Perhaps your translation translates it living sensibly or self-controlled. It has this idea of having control over the issues of life. He says, secondly, that we are also being trained to live upright lives. This word upright is the same word that we use to translate righteous. That is, we are being trained to live righteously, faithfully obeying God's word, the divine standard of what is right and wrong without reservation. And thirdly, he says that we are being trained to live godly lives. This is the exact opposite of the ungodliness that we are being trained to renounce. And it has this idea of close fellowship with our heavenly father. Father. 
And so all three of these things, Paul says, are to characterize our lives in the present age. And as they do, they are a living and powerful testimony, both within the church to each other and outside the church to a lost world of the saving and transforming power of Jesus Christ in our lives. So brothers and sisters, as we asked with the areas of renouncing, so now I ask in these areas of the things we are not to renounce, but the things we are to pursue in our lives, how are you actively pursuing these things? How are you training yourself for the purpose of godliness in the areas of self-control and righteous living and godliness? Not only must we put off certain actions and attitudes and thoughts, but so too we must put on in their place godly actions and attitudes and behaviors. You know, we're entering in this week in just a few days to New Year's, aren't we? As we enter into New Year's week, many of us make what's called New Year's resolutions, right? Perhaps consider letting these three things be the categories that help frame your New Year's resolutions this year. Ask yourself, how will this resolution help me to pursue a Christ-like self-control in my life? Ask yourself, how will this resolution that I'm making assist me in renouncing worldly passions and ungodliness? How will this thing that I'm giving myself to in this new year help me to live out a more righteous and godly life in this present age? Brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, through the power of God, for the glory of God, may we as God's people this new year be a people who are committed anew to a life of holiness, a life of obedience, a life of actively training and disciplining ourselves for the purpose of Christ's likeness. You know, we as God's people have been given an incredible privilege, an incredible opportunity, and an incredible obligation. As those to whom the grace of God has appeared in the person and work of Jesus Christ in the incarnation, and those whom look forward to the appearing of the glory of God in the second coming, we are to be men and women who actively, intentionally, and passionately pursue a life of holiness. Listen to how the 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon, you know I can't preach a sermon without quoting Spurgeon. Listen to how he put it, and I put it on the screen here for you because it's rather lengthy, but I couldn't pass up telling it to you this morning. He says, if it is so that before you blazes the supernatural splendor of the second advent and behind you burns the everlasting light of the Redeemer's first appearing, what manner of people ought you to be? If indeed you are only journeying through this present world, do not allow your hearts to be defiled with its sins. Do not learn the manner of speech of these aliens through whose country you are passing. Those who lived before the coming of Christ had responsibilities upon them, but not such as those that rest upon you who have seen the face of God in Jesus Christ and who expect to see that face again. You stand between two mornings, between which there is no evening. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you once in the incarnation and atonement of our Lord. That light is shining more and more, and soon there will come the perfect day that shall be ushered in by the second advent. He concludes, there ought to be a holy light about you, believer in Jesus, for there is the appearing of grace behind you and the appearing of glory before you. Two manifestations of God shine upon you. Like a wall of fire, the Lord's appearings are round about you. There ought to be a special glory of holiness in the midst. Amen. May that be true of you and I this morning. May we as men and women of God, be those who give ourselves to the active pursuit of holiness in our lives as we stand between these two appearances. It is one of the goals for why Christ has saved you. It is a necessary outflow of the redemption which has been granted to you. Therefore, let us give ourselves to the active and disciplined pursuit of renouncing ungodliness and worldly passions and living self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And as we do that, as we do that, we will fulfill the purpose for which Paul says in verse 14 that Jesus Christ came in the first place to give himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness, 
and to purify for, his, for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let's pray together.